Could I ask members to resume their seat? It is now time for question time, and it's questions to the, to the Minister of Justice. And I call Joanne Dobson. Thank you, Mr. Deputy Speaker. Question number one. Mr Deputy Speaker, the operational effectiveness of the 11 new PSNI District Command units established to match the current council structure is an operational matter for the Chief Constable, who is accountable to the Policing Board. While fully respecting his operational independence, I have regular discussions with the Chief Constable in relation to the outcome of operational decisions properly taken by him and what steps I might take to support the PSNI in delivering its policing plan. I call Joanne Dobson for a supplementary. Can I thank the Minister for his answer? I would like to record my dismay at the Minister failing to respond to the adjournment debate, which I tabled back in March, about how the new structures would affect my own constituents. So, can I ask, does the Minister not share my constituents' and businesses' concerns about a town the size of Bambridge, which is left without any response units? Well, I'm sorry, Deputy Speaker, I, I simply cannot, as Minister, respond to points which are operational issues for the Chief Constable. Um, members may have a certain frustration about that, but that is the reality of the policing structures which exist in Northern Ireland. And indeed, if we look back at events in perhaps 40 years ago in our history, there are good reasons why politicians shouldn't get involved in the operational policing issues. So whilst Mrs Dobson may well have genuine and reasonable concerns about policing in Banbridge, that is an issue which you must raise with the district commander and or with the chief constable, and I'm afraid not with me. I omit it to advise members that question number four has been withdrawn. Uh, I now call uh, uh, Jim Alistair. Two. Deputy Speaker, I'm grateful for the opportunity to clarify the comments that were recently attributed to me in the Belfast newsletter. I should start by setting the context for the meeting at which the alleged comment was made. This was arranged to discuss a specific life sentence prisoner who could benefit from early release arrangements as a result of the Northern Ireland Sentences Act of 1998 and was not a discussion on the workings of the HIU. In response to a question about the potential for changing the legislation in the area of home leave for early releases, I advised that this would require a change to Westminster legislation and that the issue in the future may only affect a very small number of prisoners. The comment was not made in relation to the likely number of convictions or the potential for prosecutions resulting from investigations by the proposed HIU, as has been erroneously reported. A letter was published by the newsletter correcting this serious misrepresentation of my comments on the 10th of October. I have said previously, and I will emphasize against today, that the HIU presents a unique opportunity for us to ensure that victims and relatives receive an independent Article 2 compliant investigation into the death of their loved one. I again urge my political colleagues to work together to resolve the current political challenges and ensure that the Stormont House Agreement is implemented in full in order that victims can receive the truth and justice that they deserve. I call Jim Allister. Is the Minister not attempting but failing to be too smart by half in su suggesting that he was talking about those who might, because of early release, be subject to these provisions of a weekend release, etc. When the reality is that people are only going to be in that position on foot of being convicted and subject to the 98 arrangements where they get early release. And therefore, it is a matter of the, first, uh, of the Justice Minister effectively saying that he only expects one or two convictions which would put people in that position. And does that not suggest that the HIU is window dressing uh, meant to uh, placate victims, but in fact, ultimately, will deliver very little at huge expense and create further the frustration of innocent victims. The is it not clearly that that is Minister, the minister's The member position? has asked this question. Minister. Well, Deputy Speaker, I'm not sure I should take any lessons about being too smart by half from Mr Allister, who seems to manage that quite frequently. I said exactly what I believe to be the truth, and I repeat it that that was a truthful account of the circumstances which were talking about the specifics of the possibility of somebody who, in the context of that particular case, lived close to the widow of the person who had been murdered, who received home leave because of a quirk in the arrangements for those who received life sentences 
uh, being entitled to early release, even though they may also benefit from the Sentences Act. But that cannot be certain at any point that they will receive the benefit. So it is a very limited number in there. It is nothing to do with the principle of the HIU. And whatever Mr Alistair may wish to do to denigrate the attempts that some of us are making to ensure that victims do receive justice, or if they can't receive justice, they receive truth, I will continue to do that, regardless of his efforts to denigrate it. I call Alden McGuinness. Uh, uh, thank you very much, uh, Mr. Deputy Speaker. And um, I wonder, would the minister um, like to reassure this House, despite Mr. Uh, Alistair's negative approach to the HIU, uh, that it is a valuable and necessary part uh, of the, st of the uh, Stormont House Agreement in addressing the past and giving, giving some clear answers? Uh, to the relatives of those who were slain during the course of the Troubles. Well, Deputy Speaker, I am certainly happy to agree with the point made by Mr McGuinness. There is no doubt that there are those who continue to suffer, not least because of the fact that they have not received answers to matters relating to the death of their loved one. And I believe the HIU has a very significant role in which it can fulfil. It emphasises the importance, particularly on a day like today, of ensuring we do actually address those issues. We meet the needs of those families who are suffering. And we get away from some of the misrepresentation which has gone on about the HIU and what its effect would be, and the kind of talk which has appeared in some of the media about amnesties. People need to look at the reality of what was agreed in Stormont House, and the politicians involved in the current ongoing discussions need to ensure that we actually deliver and deliver speedily for the benefit of those bereaved families. I call Chris Little. Thank you, Deputy Speaker. Can I ask the Minister for Justice to confirm that there is no provision for amnesty as uh, any part of the legacy arrangements proposed by the Stormont House Agreement, and indeed that the core aim of this work is to improve access to justice, information and services for victims and survivors? Well, I'm happy to confirm that point, as I was sort of hinting in my response to, uh, to Mr McGuinness earlier. Um, unfortunately, there was a suggestion, um, I can think of one particular news, uh, newspaper which shouldn't be dignified with being named here, which suggested that the proposals for the HIU would amount to an amnesty, and then a few days later announced that as a result of their campaign, uh, there wasn't going to be an amnesty. Anybody who reads the words of Stormont House Agreement will make it absolutely clear that the provisions for limited immunity only relate to the information provided by an individual. And if there are prosecutions possible against that individual because of other information, those prosecutions will be taken. So it's not an amnesty, it's a proper Article 2 compliant investigation, and I want to see it in place as soon as possible. I call Mike Nesbitt. Thank you, Deputy Speaker. Question three. My department is responsible for progressing the establishment of the Independent Historical Investigations Unit, which will investigate outstanding troubles related deaths taking on the legacy work of the historical inquiries team and the police ombudsman. My officials continue to work with colleagues in the Northern Ireland office to finalise the legislation which will, amongst other things, establish the HIU. The legislation to deliver those elements in the form of the Northern Ireland Stormont House Agreement Bill is, of course, subject to the ongoing political talks. My officials have also commenced work on preparation for the implementation of the HIU and subject to the political talks, this work will progress while the legislation is being debated in Parliament. I have stated previously that the Stormont House Agreement Bill, and the HIU in particular, represents a unique opportunity to, to address some of the difficult issues of our past. I once again urge the parties to work creatively to reach political agreement. We simply cannot afford to miss this chance, finally, to build structures which are capable of dealing with our troubled past. Well, Mike Nesbitt for supplementary. And I, I thank the Minister for that. Given the, the publication earlier today of the assessment on paramilitary groups in Northern Ireland commissioned by the Secretary of State and the suggestion, the clear suggestion that the Deputy First Minister takes his instructions from the Army Council of the Provisional IRA, will the Minister agree with me there can be no role for OFM DFM in the appointment of the Director of the Historical Investigations Unit? Well, I'm happy to agree with the point Mr Nesbitt makes, though I was making that point before we got to the issue of today's report. 
on the clear basis that I am keen to see that the HIU operates as a policing body in line with the structures that we have for policing in Northern Ireland. And on that basis, the appropriate body to make the appointment would be the policing board, not the DOJ, not OFMDFM, not OFMDFM in consultation with DOJ. So I'm quite happy to endorse the points which Mr Nesbitt has made, though I think I preceded him. I call Basil McRae. Uh, listen carefully to the Minister's uh, answer uh, where he said that we had to deal with our troubled past. Could I just follow on from Mr Nesbitt's question and ask him where does he think we go from here given that we have now discovered that everybody is still around, everybody is still active in one shape or another. How can we deal with our troubled past if we won't accept what's going on in the present? Well, I think, Deputy Speaker, before people make too much detailed comment uh, on the issues uh, that were in today's report, we need to look at the detail of the report and how it reflects on the activities and the structures of a range of organisations, because it's clear from the report that the leadership of all the organisations named, apart from the dissidents, uh, is clearly on a path to a different future. That is something which I believe uh, puts us into a different place, but sadly there doesn't seem to be a great deal of progress since the last report from the IMC in 2011. The important issue, it seems to me now, is that we, some le we see leadership from political parties. We complete the journey away from paramilitarism and violence, and we ensure that we provide an entirely normal, peaceful, democratic society for our people in as short a time as is possible and realistic. I call from Khan. Deputy Speaker, the specific financial impact of alcohol and drugs to my department has not been formally assessed. However, I have no doubt that substance misuse has an impact on expenditure within my department, the executive and the wider public sector. Research on the impact of alcohol alone identified the cost to Northern Ireland to be around £900 million a year with annual costs to fire and police services of up to 280 million and up to 104 million to courts and prisons. Clearly, if costs associated with other drug misuse were included, then this figure would be significantly higher. Responding to the overall impacts of substance misuse is a key focus of the executive's new strategic direction on alcohol and drugs. Whilst the Department of Health, Social Services and Public Safety leads on delivery, my department is a key contributor to that work. That contribution includes the work of Probation Board and Youth Justice Agency to assess tr treatment needs of offenders and to refer them to appropriate support services. The Prison Service, working with health partners, also provides a continuum of treatment and support for those returning to the community. While working in an environment of financial constraints, my department remains committed to working with others to tackle the misuse of these substances right across Northern Ireland. I call Fran McCann for supplementary. I thank the Minister uh, for his question thus far. And, uh, I think it, 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 it certainly is an issue uh, that is getting worse in many communities across the North. And I would ask the Minister uh, what type of strategy he has put in place with other departments, with other agencies, to try to effectively uh, deal with this uh, most serious of problems. Well, Deputy Speaker, as I said in, in my uh, Preliminary answer, the key issue is the executive's new strategic direction on alcohol and drugs, where uh, my department plays a secondary role to the Department of Health, because these are issues which are predominantly matters relating to health, though clearly there are significant issues of criminal activity related to drug use, which also need to be addressed. And that, that is something where um, there have been an increase in the number of drug seizures and the number of drug prosecutions in recent years. It's not entirely clear whether that is an indication of increased activity of criminals or whether it's better information, uh, better uh, police activity leading to more prosecutions. But certainly it's a major priority for the PSNI. It's a major priority for a number of policing and community safety partnerships, as well as the wider issues relating to health and other departments. Moving on, I call Sean Rogers. Question number six. Members will know that as Chair of the Organised Crime Task Force and Justice Minister, I welcomed the passage of the legislation to give the National Crime Agency a role here in the devolved sphere from the 20th of May, a role, however, that fits within our policing structures. 
I know, and I discussed with the, with the Director General on the 1st of October, that the NCA is making a significant contribution. This is reflected in the breadth and the nature of their new activity and the enhanced support that they've been able to provide to law enforcement partners, especially the PSNI. Significant elements of this include a joint PSNI and NCA investigation into the online access and sharing of indecent images of children, which resulted in a number of searches and arrests. There have also been complex investigations originating outside Northern Ireland, which is spread to Northern Ireland, involving crimes such as drug offences. These investigations have benefited from the NCA's broader reach across jurisdictions, as well as its ability to exercise constabulary powers within Northern Ireland. Could I thank the Minister for his statement? And given the Secretary of State's statement today, that, which has said that members of paramilitary groups continue to be engaged in violent activity, both directed by local leadership and conducted without sanction, will the PSNI be able to work with the NCA to deal with this problem? Well, Mr. Rogers makes a valid point about today's report, but I'm not sure it required today's report to see the PSNI and the NCA cooperating around issues like this. There are also, of course, other issues that the NCA has powers which weren't available before the 20th of May um, on, for example, asset seizures. And I have no doubt that we will see movement in that area, uh, which had been slowed up because of the inability of the NCA to operate for 18 months. Uh, but clearly, there are a number of issues it also relates in particular to some, a number of cross-border or near-border crimes. Um, fuel, uh, fuel laundering has a particular habit of being concentrated around the border. Uh, there's no doubt that smuggling around tobacco and fuel is also a significant issue. So it's not simply a matter of the NCA cooperating with the PSNI. It's also good work with other bodies, um, particularly on Garda Shikana, Revenue Commissioners and HMRC, to ensure a joined-up approach against all of those crimes. I call Sandra Overend. Thank you, Mr. Deputy Speaker. And I thank the Minister for, for those responses so far. Given the undoubted success of the National Crime Agency in tackling serious and organised crime in Northern Ireland, well, does the Minister agree that it was a major tactical blunder on behalf of those parties uh, who thwarted efforts to enable the NCA uh, to operate fully in, in the war against crime here, that it was, it was a major tactical blunder? Well, I thank Mrs. Overend for the support that she and her colleagues gave to my efforts to get the NCA operational. Time will tell whether the lengthy debates uh, over some of the fine-tuning of the details around the police accountability mechanisms actually achieved significant changes beyond what was achieved from the early contacts which I had with the Home Office. The important thing is that the NCA is now fully operational and able to carry out its operations in the devolved sphere and work in the kind of partnership that I've just outlined to Mr. Rogers. Moving on, I call Oliver McMullen. Very well. Last can call you. Deborah Shock, question seven. Deputy Speaker, Section 8 of the Coroner's Act 1959 places a duty on the PSNI to support the coroner's investigation into a death by providing him with all relevant information which it holds concerning the death. I fully recognise the importance of this disclosure in ensuring an effective investigation into the death compliant with Article 2 of ECHR. The process can be challenging given the volume of material that may be relevant and the need for any redactions to protect individuals' rights under Article 2 or Article 8 or to protect national security. The current draft Stormont House Agreement Bill includes proposals to regulate the onward disclosure of information by the Historical Investigations Unit. These proposals remain subject to political discussion. I am working to ensure that inquests can proceed in as timely a way as possible. Yesterday, I signed a commencement order which will make the Lord Chief Justice President of the Coroner's Courts with effect from the 1st of November. This will provide significant judicial leadership in addressing the problems and will support a judicially-led assessment of the state of readiness of the legacy inquest caseload. To complement this work, I am also inviting Criminal Justice Inspection Northern Ireland to undertake a review of the PSNI disclosure arrangements in support of the inquest and in discharge of its statutory duty. I have previously informed the House of other measures to improve the operation of inquests. There is no single answer to the challenge of legacy inquests. I am, however, taking all reasonable measures within my power and working with other bodies in the judiciary to improve the system which we have so it better delivers for bereaved families. Call Oliver McMullen. I thank the Minister for his answer so far, but does the Minister agree with me that where disclosure is prevented, that there is the probability there is an attempt to pervert the course of justice 
by covering up criminal activity that was endemic due to the policy of collusion? No, Deputy Speaker. I call Danny Kennedy. Uh, Mr Deputy Speaker, can I welcome uh, the remarks of the Minister and can the Minister outline the steps and measures that he is prepared to take to ensure that in the case of uh, legacy inquests at coroner's courts that there, will, that there will not be an exclusive and unfair focus uh, on the state and the security forces and how does he intend to address the concerns of a great many of us uh, that there are those in political parties and other groups who are seeking to use the coroner's system to simply rewrite the history of the Troubles. Well, Deputy Speaker, while I appreciate the point which Mr Kennedy is trying to make, I'm not sure that I actually have any powers to deal with the issues which he's referring to. Uh, there is no doubt that the, the issue of the reopening of inquests is something which falls entirely to the Attorney General, and members may have seen a recent legal challenge around that point. Um, of those cases which have been referred to, you know, re referred by the Attorney General, I understand that something like 32 cases involve military witnesses, so there may well be a perception in some quarters. The reality is that the Attorney General reorders inquests on the basis of his uh, best responsibilities as law officer. Uh, and on that basis, the Courts and Tribunal Service makes the practical arrangements working with the coroners to deliver those inquests. It is an issue which I believe might have perhaps been better addressed if we'd had something like the Historical Institutional Abuse Inquiry to deal with legacy inquests, but we are where we are on the basis that there was no political agreement. But in the meantime, the Courts and Tribunal Service and the judiciary will, I'm sure, continue to carry out their obligations uh, without any favour in either direction. I call Raymond McCartney. Okay, uh, last one, Corey Kest, over a hot question, number eight, please. There have been significant achievements made under the Tackling Violence at Home strategy since it was introduced in 2005. These have included the introduction of multi-agency risk assessment conferencing, a 24-hour domestic violence free phone helpline, which expanded last year to include sexual violence, a number of domestic violence media campaigns, and the introduction of routine inquiry and maternity units to encourage disclosure. Within my department, I've increased access to legal aid for victims to apply for non-molestation orders and piloted a new court listing arrangement in Derry, which seeks to improve the victim experience at court. In addition, integrated domestic abuse programs, which encourage convicted perpetrators of domestic violence to take responsibility for their behavior, have been developed and delivered. I made provision in the Justice Act of 2015 for domestic violence protection notices and orders which protect victims of domestic violence who may be at risk of immediate harm and danger. Looking to the future, my department aims to build on these successes. An official briefed the Justice Committee on the 24th of September on the Stopping Domestic and Sexual Violence and Abuse Strategy. Consideration continues to be given as to how the aims of this strategy may be progressed by my department and DHSSPS in the current difficult financial environment. The publication of the final strategy will be subject to clearance by the Minister of Health and the Executive. In the meantime, I have instructed officials to take forward the implementation of justice priorities within that strategy. I call Raymond McCartney for supplementary. Thank you very much, Deputy Speaker. And can I uh, thank the Minister for his answer? Indeed, I welcome you know, many of the steps which many of the agencies are, are obviously taking in relation to domestic violence, and the Minister has outlined a number of them. But in, perhaps in the absence of the strategy being ruled out, would the Minister give the House an assurance today? that it's not a sort of budgetary requirement or a, a budgetary deficit that prevents them from rolling out the strategy? Well, I thank Mr McCartney for his general support for the process as Vice Chair of the Committee. Um, I can't say whether or not it is a budgetary issue. The reality is uh, that the budgetary costs to the Department of Justice are, I believe, manageable given the priority which we have put to dealing with domestic and sexual violence. It is not for me to speak for the Minister of Health whenever we have one, as to the priorities of that particular department. But I do believe that the work which we are doing, which have been outlined to the committee, um, whether it be issues like you know, the court listing arrangements, um, 
looking, you know, looking at domestic homicide reviews, looking at disclosure arrangements, all of those are things which I believe it is important for my department to carry through, and we will continue to do that work whilst hoping that we can get agreement about a joined-up strategy which will be fully comprehensive and better meet the needs of society. I call John Dallet. Uh, Mr Deputy Speaker, I have listened very carefully to the Minister from this gathering of exclusively male political intellectuals, and I just wonder, does the Minister accept that the vast majority of domestic violence cases are against women? Does he recognise the wonderful work of Women's Aid, and has he sought their advice on putting together a strategy that might well address a very serious problem that for most of the time is kept quiet and under the carpet. Well, Mr Dallant may, re may re uh, recount that this is currently an exclusively male gathering, so it appears to be the case. Um, I am sure he was, however, glued to Radio Ulster at five minutes past six last Friday evening to hear his colleague Dolores Kelly uh, discuss the issue of domestic violence with me. Um, indeed, you might have noticed how full of praise Mrs Kelly was for the work being done by the DOJ, and I am sad he did not manage to quote that at this point. Um, but it is certainly the case that the vast majority of victims of domestic and sexual violence are female or indeed their children who suffer whether directly or indirectly because of violence in the home. Uh, on that basis, as the strategy was being prepared, my understanding is that Women's Aid was one of a number of organisations which helped contribute, but of course the challenge at this stage is not to have prepared the, strat uh, the strategy but to put the strategy into action, which is why, as I have said to Mr McCartney, the DOJ is doing what it can on its responsible actions, but we really do need agreement from the Minister of Health and the Executive in a fully working arrangement to ensure that we can carry the strategy forward in a comprehensive way. I call Kieran McCarthy. Thank you, Mr. Deputy Speaker. Uh, would the Minister agree that it is the lack of executive agreement on a domestic and sexual violence strategy? It is a direct consequence of the DUP's crazy shenanigans of in out and their uh, aspect uh, in relation to ministerial responsibilities? Well, I thank Mr uh, McCarthy for his question. I'm, uh, certainly, the current position is a consequence of the in out ministerial thing, where sadly, on the, on the few minutes a week we seem to have a Minister of Health, etc., uh, he hasn't found time to engage around this issue. But unfortunately, there were issues before in terms of dealing with this matter as speedily as we should have. I do believe that my department did all it could in the work on the joint strategy, uh, but it is not for me to speak for health. I just want to see ministers back at work, the executive functioning and getting the strategy agreed and all the action plans, the health bits as well as the justice bits as well as those which relate to other departments in small areas fully implemented. Patsy McGlone is not in his place. Michael McGimsey is not in his place. Pat Ramsey is not in his place. I call Colm Eastwood. Uh, question well. number 12, please. Deputy Speaker, the annual cross-border organised crime conference attended by law enforcement officers and policymakers was held on the 30th of September and the 1st of October. Over 100 delegates from North and South attended. This year's conference title was One Step Ahead, Jointly Meeting the Threat. The conference was opened by the Minister for Justice and Equality, Francis Fitzgerald TD, the Garda Commissioner, Noreen O'Sullivan, the Chief Counsel of the PSNI, George Hamilton, and me. There were presentations and workshops on the illegal production of counterfeit goods, emerging technologies, foreign national organised crime groups, and the new fuel marker. The aim was to identify and consider new and developing organised crime threats, to further develop cooperation and partnership working across the border to exchange ideas on best practice and to consider lessons learnt in order to enhance the response to organised crime in both jurisdictions. I call Colm Eastwood. Thank you very much, Mr Deputy Speaker. I can thank the Minister for, for his answers thus far. Um, given the very recent uh, tragedy uh, that we've, we saw in terms of the, uh, the murder of the, the guard and, uh, across the border and, and, and the fact that, that the, the, the culprit was somebody from the north, is the Minister confident that the, the, the appropriate levels of uh, intelligence sh sharing uh, is happening to ensure that these kind of things can't happen again? 
Well, I think Mr Eastwood has slightly expanded beyond the remit of the original question, Deputy Speaker, and it was certainly a great tragedy that saw the death of Garda Tony Golden as a result of criminal activity perpetrated by somebody who originally lived in Northern Ireland and was then living in the Republic. Uh, the issue of the organised crime response is not particularly relevant to such things, but as I actually said, uh, in the context of how we ensure the best possible public protection and deal with issues relating to domestic and sexual violence, it may well be that we have a greater need to see matters joined up across the border when people move in that respect. I'm not sure that I can say that the intelligence was ne necessarily shared exactly as it might have been uh, in that particular case, but it is something I've given a commitment to look at with my department and in conjunction with the Department for Justice and Equality as part of our ongoing cross-border work. And that is the end of our period for listed questions. And we now move on to topical questions. And I call Andy Allen. Mr. Deputy Speaker, can the Minister provide an update on his department's work with the Ulster University to examine the challenges in removing peace walls? Well, I thank Mr. Allen for the question. I think I can now um, formally welcome him to the, uh, the first time he's been a justice question and I had the chance to ask one. Um, the ongoing work around uh, the, de uh, the details of getting rid of peace walls is something which has been a fairly significant piece of work for my department. There's been work done uh, by uh, staff from uh, Ulster University looking at the, you know, how that is operating, and there's ongoing work looking at the best way of joining up the work which we do with other agencies. I'm not in a position to present a formal report at this stage, but I do believe that the contribution of the academics who have looked at the work from a slightly external position has been a benefit to my staff. There's certainly been very close engagement over the last while in dealing with that, and I think it's something which just shows the benefits of looking in a slightly wider way at some of the responsibilities that we have in government and learning from that. I call Andy Allen for supplementary. I thank the Minister for his re response. Can the Minister outline when he expects the results of the Attitudes to Peace Walls survey to be released? I think, Deputy Speaker, that, that uh, the, the next round of that survey is due to be released within the next few weeks. Um, I will certainly see that whenever it is released, it is placed in the Assembly Library and members will be informed of that. But it is clear when he talks about attitudes to, uh, to peace walls that Mr Allen has raised a very significant issue because there is no doubt uh, that there are still those who feel the need for physical protection, particularly if they live very close to interface structures, and yet there are many others who recognise that the best interests of society are served by the removal of those structures when we can deal with those genuine fears amongst those who live close to them. We will not develop a normal society. We will not grow our economy. We will not be able to move away from the issues of the past if we cannot continue the action which has seen six interface structures removed during my time as minister and significant engagement around many others. The member listed for topical question number two has withdrawn his name. I call uh, Sean Rogers. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Uh, could I ask the Minister, how significant is the budget spend in your department for dealing with young people in the criminal justice system, particularly with issues of spe specific learning difficulties, say, compared to other jurisdictions? Uh, Mr Deputy Speaker, that sounds like a, a question which has a well-prepared supplementary. Um, and, and I congratulate Mr Rogers for that. I, ca I cannot at this stage give an assessment of the expenditure within Northern Ireland compared to other neighbouring jurisdictions in the way he has asked it. Um, sadly, ministers don't always have every last bit of detail at their fingertips when they answer topical questions. Uh, but if he wishes to expand on it in the supplementary, I would do my best either to answer or to see that we provide the information later. I call Sean Rogers. You've guessed right. Um, do you believe, Minister, that effective early intervention in the home and school would have a significant impact on the spend in your budget, that you could spend your budget other ways rather than uh, so much spent in education? Well, I'm certainly happy to agree with Mr Rogers on that point. The need for early interventions is a critical issue. Um, when I look at the, the issue of early interventions, I, I can see it in two different uh, categories. One is the very early life interventions. 
and the Department of Justice contributes to some of those uh, projects on a cross-departmental basis, even though in very blunt terms we are unlikely to see the benefit for that intervention within the DOJ for 12 or 14 years until young children have grown up and might become a nuisance or criminals, uh, whereas education and health will see the response back very quickly. But I believe as part of a commitment to a joint up approach that is necessary. I also think, particularly through the work of PCSPs and others, we're seeing some good work that's being done in the sense of early interventions of young teenagers who are in danger of getting involved in trouble. Remember a couple of years ago, I saw three different projects within the space for about six weeks, all of which were doing that kind of work, done by, organized by different organizations in different parts of Northern Ireland, but each of them was fundamentally about establishing personal relationships and providing good role models for those young people. And they were all excellent examples of how very modest investments were helping young people stay out of trouble. And certainly, I am committed to supporting that as best I can, given current budgetary constraints. Moving on, I call Michaela Boyne. Uh, Minister, can you provide an overview in whether confidence in policing and justice structures uh, will be undermined if public interest immunity is granted in the inquest of Arlene Arkison? Well, I'm not in a position to give any assessment as to what public interest would be in that particular context. Um, Ms Boyle, obviously, as a, you know, a relevant constituency MLA, may have some slightly different uh, or some slightly more specific ideas than I do. But the reality is there are reasons why, at times, public interest immunity certificates are granted, and those do not fall to me. Uh, they tend to fall to the Secretary of State, and it will be very difficult for me to give any detail on that. I call Michaela Boyle. Uh, uh, Minister, uh, uh, obviously you are the Minister and people will look to you for public confidence and I'm sure you'll join with me at this time and our thoughts and prayers going out to the Arkison family and seeking justice for Arlene. However, Minister, do you accept that many people believe that Robert Howard was an RUC special branch informant who was shielded by prosecution at that time by them and that, and that the Chief Constable should state why public interest immunity has been sought? Gormogut. With Deputy Speaker, I can't possibly answer that question. It may well be the pace, case that individuals have concerns, but it is not an issue which falls to my department to have any responsibility for. I call John Dallet. Uh, Mr <coughs> Deputy Speaker, I'm sure the Minister was greatly excited by the recent announcement that there would be yet another Loyalist Council to deal with paramilitaries that 18 years on still are not in the political process. Can he hold out any hope that this might end parallel policing and parallel courts of justice, which have been going on for far too long, particularly in Northampton and East Derry that I represent? Well, I certainly share the concerns which Mr Dallas has expressed about the behaviour uh, of the UDA in his constituency and the North Antrim area. Um, clearly, there are still those who think that they have rights to act in a way that they did not ever legitimately have. I think what we've seen when we look at the, uh, the report which has just been published by the Secretary of State uh, this afternoon and see the, the debate which is, was happening in the House of Commons as I came into this chamber, or the, the discussion on the statement, it is clear uh, that there is now a major issue to be addressed in recognising that organisations which have moved to some extent since Good Friday 1998 need to complete the journey away from paramilitarism, away from violence, away from threat, and away from the criminal activities that so many of them are involved in. Mr Deputy Speaker, I thank the, the Minister for what I think is a very honest answer. Would the Minister agree with me that there was never a greater yearning uh, to face a future which embraces everybody and leaves, behas, leaves behind a, a past which failed everybody? Has he got the resources to be part of that? Is he on board? Well, Mr. Dalla can rest assured that the Department of Justice and the agencies with which we work are on board to establish a peaceful, lawful society. But it is not just an issue for the criminal justice system. It is an issue which requires a joined up approach. It is an issue which, most of all, requires five parties and two governments meeting in Stormont House, I trust, tomorrow morning 
to actually get on to deal with these issues in a realistic, meaningful, joined up way so that we can put paramilitarism behind us, that we can see on the shortest time scale possible an end to those activities which were reported as still being in existence today. I call Fergal McKinney. Thank you, uh, Mr. Deputy Speaker. And can I return to the theme of early intervention? And uh, can the minister say whether or not any assessment has been made of the likely impact on his budget of health department decisions, such as those uh, including the closure of addiction services, for example, in Balamina? Well, I can't say that any specific assessment has been given. I mean, when, uh, when Mr. McKinney speaks about Balamina, there, you know, there are issues around specifically the Railway Street project, which was funded in part by the Department of Justice, uh, which, frankly, it was not possible to continue funding at at the level that had previously been the case. It was no pleasure to talk about withdrawing funding from that. It was the reality of the world in which we live and the failure to resolve significant financial issues. Uh, and the problems the executive collectively had in setting up a budget has made it very difficult to do the work we need to do. It is very difficult to put money into prevention in the way that we would wish when we haven't got the money we need to deal with today's problems. I call Fergal McKinney. Thank you, Mr Deputy Speaker. Earlier, uh, the Minister reflected on how uh, an education intervention might take 12 or 14 years to feel the benefit of, but clearly uh, this type of intervention could pitch up on the Minister's uh, uh, desk much sooner than that. So does he recognise that fact and what conversations would he or could he be having with the Department of Health uh, in order to mitigate it? Well, I take uh, Mr McKinney's point slightly, Deputy Speaker. I think I actually said that in the context of early childhood interventions, uh, the Department of Justice might well take 12 to 14 years to get its benefit, whereas health and social services and education could see their benefits within two to three years. But he's right to highlight that there can well be problems if we fail to deal with issues like addiction, that it can have uh, costs on the criminal justice system at a, you know, a fairly speedy rate. Nonetheless, the fact remains, if we haven't got the budget to do all that we need to do, difficult decisions have been made, prioritisation has happened. Uh, his colleague has just highlighted the issue of ongoing paramilitary violence. That's something which also needs to be considered. So we cannot do all that we would wish in current circumstances. But if members of this assembly uh, could see the way to ensuring that we can get the necessary financial arrangements made, if we could see budgets being carried that were workable, if we could set out plans which actually put into practice what the programme for government is supposed to talk about, then we'd be in a better position. I call Colm Eastwood. Thank you, Mr Deputy Speaker. Can the Minister give us his assessment of the level of criminal assets held by people associated with paramilitaries? Well, I cannot give any specific assessment on that, Deputy Speaker, but uh, members of the House will be well aware of assessments which have been made by others, um, notably in the Republic in recent time, which would suggest that very substantial assets are held. Uh, that's another reason why it was good to get the National Crime Agency operational. It's also a reason that we need to see all the range of relevant bodies, because it's not just the Pierce now and the Garda Shikana, it's a range of bodies on both sides of the border which need to be carrying out actions against those who are uh, hoarding criminal assets as a result of criminal activity directed against this society. Call, call me, uh, thank you, Mr Deputy Speaker. Thank you, Minister, for his answer. And he's right, it was good to get the NCA operational, I suppose, only after a lot of work was done by this party to ensure that it was properly accountable. But can he give us yeah. his assessment of how much in terms of criminal assets has actually been recovered by the NCA, SACA or anybody else? Well, I don't have the, you know, the historical figures for the um, Assets Recovery Agency, SACA, uh, Mr Deputy Speaker. My understanding is that there, uh, there has been uh, nothing specific recovered by the NCA at this point, although there is preliminary work ongoing, partly because the NCA staff who were dealing with that kind of work were until May. Uh, committed to supporting their colleagues in England, Wales and Scotland uh, in terms of the work they were doing there and will continue to do some of that work in the meantime. Uh, but it is clear that now that we have the focus of the NCA fully operational in Northern Ireland, they will be in a position to follow up on those matters and I understand that there are a number of cases which are now under serious investigation. I call Fra McCann. The last call, call, uh, th uh, thank you very much, Mr. Deputy Speaker. Uh, can the uh, Minister tell us what steps he has taken to tackle the growing issue of cybercrime? 
Well, um, if he's asking what the Minister is doing, the Minister is supporting a number of operational agencies. Uh, there is very significant work being done on cybercrime by the National Crime Agency. I highlighted earlier the work being done um, on the issue of child exploitation and the horrendous issues of child sexual abuse and the use uh, of that. There is you know, ongoing work being done by the police. Uh, in conjunction with the NCA across a range of criminal activities because there's no doubt that uh, if any crime is possible these days, it's either possible to carry it out uh, on, you know, on a cyber basis or else uh, electronic communications are assisting the carrying out of that crime. Uh, people have discovered that it's sometimes easier to rob a bank than putting on a balaclava and, you know, and walking in with a big bag. Uh, cyber activity has dealt with that. Uh, I spoke at a conference in Lisburn which was focusing on cyber crime just a couple of weeks ago and there are significant efforts being made by a range of organisations to make people more aware and to advise people to be very cautious of what they see in emails, what they get in telephone calls even, um, those things which promise too much are almost certainly too good to be true and people need to be aware of that at the same time as the agencies need to take resolute action. And that is the end of our questions to the Minister of Justice.